uh, speak than what a typical webinar does. So I'd like to spend a little bit of time describing Shindig. Uh, but um, first, let me tell you, we have uh, over the next two weeks, we have two more sessions. Uh, one session on five ways to use video. And uh, the following week will be active learning strategies in the class in the classroom with Matt Joseph. Uh, I, I know that you, you've gotten here, so you probably know how to register through www.edchatinteractive.org. Uh, let me expand this for a second and uh, show you the screen. Uh, this is, uh, you should be seeing something similar to this. You see avatars of people on the screen and your own video avatar kind of in the bottom center of the screen and me and the slide up on top. Uh, what you'll see is a menu next to your avatar and all the way on the left is something called text chat. Uh, that's the way that you can talk to each other and also talk to the presenters. And I'd like to encourage you to do that. As a matter of fact, right now, what I'd like you to do is to click on text chat. Um, you should end up with a screen that looks approximately like this. And why don't you introduce yourself and talk about and just mention one thing. And who are you? Where are you from? And what's something that you'd like to learn tonight? So the, the one person who can't see that is me. Um, but um, our speakers can see it and they can they can respond. Uh, when you're done, uh, click you can click back on the text icon uh, to, to change the view back to this back to this view. Uh, the second way of interacting is through asking questions. Now you can always ask questions through text chat, and that may be the most uh, efficient way for you to do it because the speakers can see that, um, and other people who are also participating can type into text chat also. But you can also click on the question mark button. Uh, that will allow you to ask a question to me. If it's a technical question, I can answer it. If it's a question for the speakers, I can pass it on to them. Uh, the third way of interacting is for you to click on the raise hand button. When you click on the raise hand button, that shows me that you want me to contact you um, and or it could mean that you'd like to come up on stage. And there's going to be times where our speakers say, hey, we'd, we'd like to, to find out what you think about this or how would you apply this or what's the situation that you have? Um, and give you an opportunity to come up on stage. So they'll say, just uh, raise your hand. And that doesn't mean raise your hand. It means click on the raise hand button, in which case I can bring you up on stage and you can have a conversation with them. And then the final way of interacting would be that if you click on another person and, and you know, see, you see that there's two people who are doing this right now. If you click on another person, you can actually have a private conversation with that person. And what we're going to be doing a couple times during this evening is we're going to encourage you to do that, to talk to another participant here about what um, what you're doing and what they're doing. And we all know that we learn best when we're active. So I'd like to really encourage you to use all of these tools of Shindig. Uh, type in information into the text chat. Um, when we ask for volunteers to come up on stage, it's really fun. And so raise your hand and come up on stage. And when we ask you to break into, into little groups uh, for a small group work, um, contribute. Uh, and that's you'll you'll find that it's fun, and you're going to learn a lot more. So, uh, without further ado, let me uh, let me bring up Lynn and Randy. So first, I'm going to bring up Randy because I happen to have clicked on him first, and then I'm going to bring up Lynn. And here's Lynn, and there's there's Randy. Randy, good evening. Hey, Mitch, how are you? Good, good. So you guys weren't hit by the hurricane. You're in Pennsylvania, right? You you, you may have been wet, but you, you had no hurricane? No hurricane, but it certainly was was very, very wet today. Uh, it was uh -huh. uh, lots of heavy downpours, wasn't it, Lynn? Yes, heavy downpours. I needed valet service. <laughs> oh, right. And uh, my son had a soccer game, so downpour for that as well. <laughs> yes. But school wasn't canceled or anything like that? No. no, we're fortunate. No. Yeah, I think good. Tomorrow's going to be a beautiful fall day finally. Oh, that it's it's about time. <laughs> so yeah, <laughs> um, we I I've been um, 
on weekends, we've been having uh, this exchange student who's spending her weeks in New York City and the, or weekends with us. And uh, the weekends have not been great weather. So uh, we've been having to find things for her to do um, that, you know, a 15-year-old, 16-year-old kid would, would, would enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. um, but that aren't outside. So it's been, it's been a little challenging because our kids are, are, you know, our adults are uh, 29 and 32. So, so I pulled up your slides. I'm going to pull, I'm going to expand your slides so that people can see them better. And I'll pull myself down and just tell me when to advance and um, welcome aboard. Enjoy. Sounds good. Thanks again for having us, Mitch. All right. So, uh, Good evening, everybody, and, and maybe it's even an afternoon or morning, depending on, on where you are when you're either watching this or uh, joining us. So my name is Randy Ziegenfuss. I'm the superintendent in the Salisbury Township School District, and uh, glad to be here this evening um, with my counterpart, uh, and this is Lynn. Hi, everyone. Good to be here. So this evening, Lynn and I wanted to uh, talk with this group and interact with you around this idea of leading transformation. And we hear this word a lot um, within our profession, and it almost has become a buzzword. And uh, I think our goal tonight is really to uh, define that a little bit better and talk about some examples and where our thinking and how we frame this idea of transformation. And as the title suggests, what works and what doesn't around uh, transformation within education. Uh, and this presentation, um, you can certainly follow along here in the Shindig platform, but we've also created a Bitly. It's a good, actually a Google slideshow. So if you wanna take a screen capture of that or quickly access that presentation, you can follow along uh, in that. If that's your mode of learning, you can certainly do that as well. So I think with that, um, let's get started and go to the next slide, please. So uh, we've got a couple of guiding questions this evening. Um, I think we're booked for an hour and uh, I think we've got enough content uh, to, to cover a couple of different questions here. So first the question is why? So why do we need to lead transformation within our organizations? Um, why, what's driving that change? What's driving that need? And then the second question is how do we develop a vision for if we're transforming to something, what, what is that endpoint? What is that vision? And how do we set expectations for that? And then the last question that we want to talk about is around leadership. So once we have this concept of transformation in our mind, what do we do as leaders? And uh, Lynn and I will be sharing some of our own experiences, uh, but we'll also be interested to hear your experiences and learn from the work that you're doing and how you're framing transformation. Um, within your particular organization. So I think we're ready for the next slide. So give you a glimpse into how we're framing this idea of transformation. Um, over the last several years, we've had a lot of conversations within our organization and have also looked outside the organization and thought about what, what is the future that our students are going to go into and asking the question of does our current school system really meet the needs of today's learners and are those learners going out into the world becoming productive citizens, productive employees, productive workers. Uh, and so as you can see in this slide, uh, we're framing transformation around a very big shift uh, and looking at transformation as this idea of something totally new uh, and if you look at the left-hand side, you see some characteristics and qualities of what's called school-centered, and that's what we call the dominant paradigm. This is the conversation that um, most people in education have around school. And the transformation that we're working for in, in our school district, which is slow and a lot of heavy lifting, is more towards learner-centered. And if you look at the qualities on that right-hand side, you'll notice that it is a transformation. It's a very different way of thinking. Um, we've done some work with Education Reimagined and the way that they frame it is this idea of a shifted paradigm or shifting the paradigm. And uh, if you just look at you know, one of those and looking at the, on the left-hand side, look at number two down, education is done to the learner. Um, oftentimes that's what we think. We've got content, we've got 
um, curriculum, we got standards, we push that content out onto learners really with little um, thought about who they are, what are their passions, what are their interests. And um, on the right side, the transformation of that particular element is that education is done by and with the learner. So it's a collaborative process. It's an understanding of what are the passions, what are the interests, and that then, with those in mind, requires a different way of looking at teaching, a different way of looking at the role of teachers, a different way of looking at the role of learners within the organization. So we're sort of framing this idea of transformation around school-centered versus learner-centered, with school-centered being the dominant paradigm, and the transformed paradigm is this idea of learner-centered. Okay, we'll take the next slides. And this is a video that um, is actually from the World Economic Forum about what they're calling the fourth industrial revolution. And, and in the interest of time, we're not gonna show this, but it paints a really, what we think is a fascinating picture about the future, about how technology is going to transform or has transformed our society. And what are the new knowledge sets, skill sets and dispositions that workers in that society, that citizens in that society are going to have to have. So if you've uh, got the presentation and you certainly have the link afterwards uh, and you're interested in looking at that video, um, you can certainly check that out. It, it provides a good context for this idea of transformation. Next slide, please. So let's uh, have our first uh, breakout and uh, we'll have the opportunity to connect with each other uh, through a connection question, a couple connection questions. And the purpose of this is really um, for us to understand who's here and what is your context and what are some of the ways that you frame transformation and that you're thinking about some of these introductory ideas that have been put out here. So um, this this is the time for you to let, let me shrink the, the, uh, the slides a little bit. And I'm going to bring you two down so you can join the groups, OK? And then I'll, I'll, I'll text you. Um, so this is the time to click on the avatar of another person and um, and join up. And you can also click on the avatars of the speakers. If you, um, so, or, And they may be clicking on your avatar also. So uh, we'll give you all a few minutes to break into small groups to answer these questions, and I'll pull myself down.
Okay, let me bring Lynn and Randy up. Um, so, so Lynn, so I'm just going to ask you. So, why is this important? Yeah. So, I think um, for Randy and and I, this work is important because we're ready for what's next. And this is a really nice segue for us into our next portion of the slideshow. Um, we have spent a significant amount of time and and um, money investing in resources for our teachers and our learners. And at this point, um, we feel like it was really important to define our vision and to clarify what we want our learners to know and be able to do and what we want our classrooms to look like so that their classrooms um, are providing the kinds of learning experiences that we think our students need in order to be successfully prepared for whatever they choose to do in the future. Mm -hmm. um, so for us, it's really about thinking critically about our work to better meet the needs of all of our learners so that they have an opportunity to grow and um, really become learners and um, move forward successfully in whichever, whichever direction or path they choose to move. So, so just a, another question is, you know, we, um, you're going to be talking about FETC. And so that's like the future of ed tech. What does ed tech have to do with this? Because this is changing the paradigm of teaching. That's not necessarily ed tech, right? Right. Well, I think the, and we'll, we'll, we'll get to this in the, in the slides ahead. Oh, but then, okay. Then we can educate. Let's just give you a little, little glimpse here. I think education our school systems live in a context. They mm -hmm. live in a context, and that context has is is very technology dependent, and mm -hmm. it's not going away. It's not a fad, and it's actually shaping and transforming many sectors of the world in which we live in. And it is going to, if it hasn't already, transform education. And education needs to stay at pace with that shifting context in the in the real world. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about that coming up in terms of the why. Okay. Well, um, so I'll, I'll move myself back down um, unless uh, I, I see, you know, somebody else wants to raise their hand and come up. Uh, you can certainly come up and, and uh, but in the meantime, um, I've expanded the slides. I'll bring myself down and I'll advance the slide. Okay. Thank you, Mitch. And um, Lisa, would you like to talk a little bit more about your idea? Lisa shared in the chat that EdTech is technology-enabled pedagogy. Um, Lisa, if you're interested in sharing a little bit more about that, you just have to click on the hand button, and then Mitch can bring you up on stage so that you can share your ideas. Okay, so let's keep talking and um, we're going to talk a little bit about the why and you can see some photos here. These are um, so young, young students, young learners in our school district. We both work in Salisbury Township School District, a small school district. Uh, we have 1600 students in four buildings, K to 12. Um, so we are pretty small. We have a diverse student body. We have diversity in um, backgrounds and socioeconomic status. Uh, we have a variety of learning styles in our learners and learners with individual needs. Um, so we're looking at the big picture and, and really why do we need this transformation? And the work is really for our learners and help helping our learners be prepared for whatever is next. And we talk about the year 2031 because that is the year that our current uh, kindergarten students will actually be graduating from Salisbury Township School District. So think about your learners and the stake that you have in preparing all of those learners, whether they're graduating this year in uh, 2019 or any of those years between now and 2031. And we want to elevate our educational um, system for those learners. So I'll give you a moment to take a look at this quote and then we'll share an idea or two. So 
So we're all leaders. I mean, anyone here watching this this recording or watching live tonight and engaging in the conversation, we're all leaders, regardless of what role or title we have, regardless of um, whether you're an administrator or you're a teacher leader, or even, even a parent might be interested in watching this. So thinking of us all as leaders with or without the title, we always have to think about what's here in front of us now and what's next. You know, how do we anticipate what's happening in the future? Because what we're doing right now is probably not going to help our students who graduate in 2031 be successful. So we are always sort of patrolling this idea or this edge between now and next. And we'll share a couple of examples of that um, and why it's important for us to think about that through the future and plan for these learners so they're prepared for what's next. And these are our learners, right? So um, these are our learners in our schools. These are our learners around the world. And these learners are the learners who are going to be tasked with solving our world's um, most challenging problems. Um, this is a great little video. It's motivational. It really helps us identify what's important and why we need to do the work we do. We're not going to play it tonight, but it's embedded into the, um, into the video. If, if you'd like to go ahead and see it, you can see it in the slideshow. And looking at our, uh, this quote here, thinking about our learners, our learners are only 20% of our population, but these learners are going to be the ones who solve our problems of the future. So that's a pretty powerful thought. Like these are our learners, this is who we're working for. Um, all of us in education are working for our future and we're working to do the best that we can in a learner-centered system for these learners. And if you take a look at this next slide, you'll see these are sustainable development goals um, through the UN and these are big lofty growth worldwide goals. Um, if you take a look at some of those goals, some of these challenges that we're going to face in the years ahead, and those learners, our learners of today, our graduates of 2019 all the way through 2031 and beyond, these are the learners who are going to solve the problem of making sure we have clean water and sanitation around the world, making sure we have affordable and clean energy around the world, um, making sure that we eliminate poverty and make sure that everybody is um, has the food that, that he or she needs to live. So these are some pretty lofty goals, and we're preparing our students to solve these goals, to work collaboratively with others in a global economy um, to solve these goals. So pretty, pretty lofty when you look at that set of uh, sustainable development goals. So as we prepare our learners for tomorrow and what's next, and we think about this fourth industrial revolution, we know that technology is changing. Um, we know that we have AR and IR. You've probably seen or um, learned about Alexa in the Amazon product, or maybe Google Home or, or Apple's product. And these, these AR products are, are learning new skills and they're evolving quite quickly, actually, when you think about Alexa's not that old and some of the things that, that she can already do, what's that going to look like in a couple of years? Um, think about some other emerging technologies. We have the 3D printers, um, IBM Watson, IBM Watson Education, and IBM Watson Health, and even the wearables, our, our Apple Watches, and um, some of those other fitness wearables that really help us better understand data about ourselves. Well, all of these technologies uh, are going to use computers, but they're also going to need humans to help them learn and humans to help them work. So we need to make sure that our students are prepared to do the skills um, to help develop the technology further, skills that computers aren't yet good at, that computers haven't yet learned. So we're thinking about you know, what's next? What are the challenges of our economy? What is the workforce going to look like? What kind of skills do students need for the for their future to be successful? So I just, you know, I pop up because as I'm looking at these, I'm thinking, so these are the these are skills that you can't learn from a traditional classroom, that you can't stand in front of a classroom and say, I'm going to teach you how to make sense you know I'm going to teach you how to do computational thinking these are things that require a different type of learning which is really what you're talking about in terms of transformation is that right 
Right. So if you think about a traditional class, Mitch, and you have a teacher starting standing in the front of the room and kids are maybe taking notes or um, working on a worksheet or filling in a, a document, they're not learning to collaborate, right? But if we could design a new task where students have to work together, where students have to create a deliverable, where they're on stage for their peers or experts, where they're getting feedback, um, maybe they're working during school and beyond the school, school walls, now we can teach them some tools and we can teach them some norms and some expectations and some skills they need to learn virtual collaboration or face-to-face -face collaboration. So Thank you. you're right in that we have to redesign our learning tasks and we have to redesign our learning environments. I could also add too that we're also redesigning how we assess those skills too. So, you know, Mitch alluded to the fact that traditional classrooms don't necessarily focus on those but we also don't assess those in the same way too. So transforming not only how we provide opportunities for students to develop those, but also how as educators, we're going to assess and evaluate whether students have those skills. We can't do that in the same traditional way. And I just want to emphasize, Randy, um, that one of our chat participants, Lisa, agrees that the formative assessments are key. And, and how do we create these opportunities for formative assessments? So appreciate that insight. And yes, we do need to teach those skills. And we need to think really thoughtfully about the kinds of learning tasks that we're providing and creating and developing and designing and the assessments that are embedded into that task for iteration and improvement for, for our learners. Thanks for adding that, Lisa. So this next video is a really powerful video, and it it sort of um, and hopefully you've you've seen it. It's about eight minutes, so it's probably too long for this this um, webinar tonight. But this is a video that we recently used with a group of leaders when we were talking about the why for transformation, and it's a really powerful video in which a young child. Um, walks to school and starts with the exuberance and energy of a kindergartner and um, is really excited to, to head off to school and um, visits and sees a, sees a violinist along the way and the, the parent kind of drags, drags him along, gets, gets the child into school and then the parent goes to work and gradually the Gradually, the parent, um, the child sort of lose the, loses his enthusiasm for learning in the classroom, and he really wants to get back to that, that violinist. And it shows some of the underlying, underlying assumptions related to very school-centered learning. Everybody gets to school on time. Everybody does the pile of worksheets. Everybody follows the very clear instruction or the recipe. Um, and it, it just continues in a very structured cycle. So it's a powerful video. Randy, what, don't you think we had a, a great conversation with those leaders talking about that video and um, some of those assumptions there? Definitely. So check it out. Yeah, definitely worth taking a look at. It is, it's a little long, but um, if people aren't sure why or people maybe don't understand this idea of school-centered it's a really good thought-provoking um, video to get started. So let's take a moment to pause there and think about, you know, why do you need to lead this transformation in your context and what can that look like um, in your context? You know, why is the important? Why is this important? Sorry, I, I, I queued I up a little bit late, um, but I'll, um, I'll bring you two I'll down so you can join small group work if you'd like. Okay, and, sounds great. Um, and so this is another time uh, for you to pair up and talk about, you know, how this might look in your classroom or in your school. Um, and of course, you can also click on uh, Lynn and Randy and you can talk about it directly with them. So I'll pull myself down and we'll come back up in a couple of minutes. Oh, and hopefully this time somebody will volunteer to come up on stage and talk about it with, uh, uh, with Randy and Lynn as well.
Okay, let me bring Lynn and Randy up. And here comes Randy. So, so Lynn, I'm, I'm thinking about this either, let's say, as a school or as a teacher wanting to do this in my own class. And let's, you know, just thinking about it from the school standpoint, why can't a school just have a half day of professional development at the beginning of August and basically that's, that's it, right? <laughs> yeah, this is heavy lifting. <laughs> this is heavy lifting. Um, you, Randy and I have spent a, <laughs> a right. couple of years, right? Um, and mm -hmm. our teachers have been working hard at this and, and we have had varying levels of success, but this requires um, some system change, you know, to really create this opportunity. It requires policy change, probably, when we look about really moving into a, a learner-centered environment. Um, but it's significant task redesign and significant instructional planning and significant learning for us as leaders and also for our teachers as they design these, these learning opportunities. So um, this is heavy lifting, slow work, exciting work, but it's going to take us some time. So if I were a principal and I wanted to do this in my school, it might, I might need to ease into it by over a co the course of a couple of years. It's, it's not going to happen in one year. Okay. Now, if I'm a teacher and I want to try it, I don't necessarily have to change everything I'm doing for the entire school year at once. There must be ways, and you're probably going to go through this, but there must be ways to ease into it that maybe, maybe I can try doing this type of an approach for a few lessons first. Sure. So we actually are working with our district level team um, and we have planned some professional learning for this year in which all of our teachers are working to redesign two um, tasks. So two significant redesign tasks and mm -hmm. we're scaffolding that process and Randy's going to talk a little bit about that in the next segment. Okay. In the meantime, uh, if somebody would like to come up on uh, stage and share your thoughts, uh, click on the raise hand button and I'll bring you up on stage. Uh, but if nobody's, yeah, hopefully somebody's going to do that. It's fun. And you want to do this in your, in your schools also. You want your kids, if, if you're running classes with your kids, you want your kids to volunteer. And if you're running professional development, you want your teachers to volunteer. So, um, so be the change. <laughs> but in the meantime, I'll bring I'll I'll expand the slides and I'll bring myself down and um, and we'll advance. So Mitch, yeah, I'm while sure. you're I... okay, go ahead, Lynn. No, go ahead. Nice and loud, Randy. Okay, I just wanted to add to Mitch's question about well, just that half day PD, you know, <laughs> and and you know certainly Lynn explained that too. But if you think back to that earlier slide of school centered versus learner centered lynn oftentimes reminds me it's all about mindset and it, it's very easy to just say change change move do stop doing this column and start doing this column but we've got to change the way that we think about that and that takes time and we need to give as leaders we need to give a space um, to our students our parents our teachers and our principals to be able to make that change a change is a, it's an adaptive change. It's not a technical change. It's not a quick way to do this. Um, so I think that's a big piece of transformation too. Yeah. And as we were so in our, on, go ahead. as we were in our small group um, session, one of our participants mentioned that, you know, school didn't really work all that well for her. She shared that um, she would head outside and her principal could find her in a tree reading a book. And um, so to me, that sounds like she's a learner. She wants to read. She wants to gain knowledge. She um, enjoyed that aspect, but she didn't actually enjoy school. Um, and I wonder how many of our kids have that same experience. You now, we were in a superintendent advisory council today, and we actually asked students to line up on, on a value line um, to tell us a little bit about their school experience. And one of the questions that we asked was, you know, do you like to come to school? And we asked students to line up anywhere from, yes, I would stay here all day and all night, basically, to no, I can't wait to get out of here. And we had, um, I don't know what, 20 middle school students, Randy, maybe. 
And everywhere from, I can't wait to get out of here to please give me more. Uh, many of the kids were somewhere in the middle and, um, you know, setting this why and, and taking the time and investing the time, as you said, Randy and, and Mitch, is really important to make sure that we're, we're reaching all of those kids on that line. Good points. Thank you for sharing that. So moving on, uh, second question for tonight, and it looks like we've got about 20 minutes left. How do we develop a vision and clear expectations for transformation? So once you've wrapped your head around this idea of transformation, what does that look like? What's this vision? Um, so what we want to do is share a little bit of our story. So uh, a number of years ago, we started out with a big audacious question. What knowledge, skills, and dispositions should a Salisbury graduate graduate possess? And this is a great question that any school or school district can talk about and can help uh, create a vision for that transformation. So in our school district, we have a series of graduates each year. And this next slide um, is a pretty represent, pretty good representation of what, what uh, leaves our school on our high school on an annual basis. So we have about 150 graduates uh, and most of them go on to some form of, of additional learning or education, whether it be traditional four-year college university, um, two-year community college, or a technical trade school, and some of the schools there on the right where they go to. So by traditional metrics, that's pretty good, pretty good. But is that good enough when we look back at that why that Lynn talked about earlier, about that larger context of the world, the future, and technology? And we had that curiosity. And so uh, we did a year long sort of action research project to answer that question of what are the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that we want for our graduates to have. So we'll take the next slide. And of the next bunch of slides actually take you through some of our process. So this was probably back in 2015. And if you're following the, the Google slide show, um, there's a link there that will take you to some projects um, that we did through some professional development uh, where we were aiming to get pockets of innovation uh, into our schools. And we called it Innovate Salisbury. And we provided um, professional development, professional learning for interested teachers to develop some innovations. And we connected um, with various thought leaders. Uh, we started a podcast. And our teachers and us learned about these innovations and we built, started to build the capacity of the organization um, around innovation and change and transformation. Next slide. And so going back to that big audacious question, we wanted to engage all of our stakeholders and this included our students, our teachers, our parents, our school leaders, our school board, our community, and uh, everybody that makes up the Salisbury community. And you see some pictures here of our school board members. Um, Lynn mentioned our student advisory. This was our middle school student advisory uh, several years ago when we were answering that uh, big question and going around and having conversations with all these different stakeholders. Next slide. Student advisory groups during that year, we asked them several questions. How do you learn in school and how do you learn outside of school? What kinds of things do you create in school and what kinds of things do you create out of school? And that really helped us connect with what are these students passionate about? How is that connected to school? And how is it sometimes even disconnected from school? So connecting with students around these big questions. Next slide. And in order to get to know what is it like, the life of a student, we participated in the national challenge. If you Google shadow a student, you'll see that this is an actual um, national effort that happens once a year. Um, there's a, a period of time, usually in the winter months, where they encourage school leaders to actually shadow a student. And all of our administrative team, we've done this now for three years. And it's been really transformational in terms of us understanding the life of a student. What's it like to be in a powerful learning environment? What's it like to be in a learning environment that's a little bit more passive? Next slide. 
And through that Innovate Salisbury group, we obviously asked this question of our teachers. So here you see a couple of snapshots about what kinds of skills, soft skills, those hard skills, um, and some various pictures of their thinking around this uh, answers to this question. Next slide. So in addition to gaining student and teacher input, we wanted to connect with our community. So we offered some evening sessions and we also had some conversations with our school board around that big question. Next slide. And of course our leadership team. Don't forget your leadership team. Their capacity needs to be built as well. And we had a number of different activities throughout that year of exploration around what knowledge, skills, and dispositions our learners need. Next slide. We took all of that data that was gathered over many, many months, and we fed that back to that stakeholder group um, in various ways, including a survey. So all of our stakeholders that wanted to participate had the opportunity to participate. Um, and we synthesized uh, all that knowledge and we put it into um, what we call our profile of a graduate, which is on our next slide. Actually, that's not the next slide, but we'll talk about question week. Okay, there's <laughs> the next slide. Um, so on the right there, you see our profile of a graduate, uh, the knowledge, literacies, disposition, and skills. This is sort of synthesized that whole year's worth of work around that question what knowledge, skills, and dispositions do our graduates need? And then we actually asked another question because, you know, good inquiry has lots of uh, questions and leads to more and more questions. So that first question led to a second question. And what do our learning environments need to look like now so that we can prepare our kids for this vision, for this vision that was articulated in the profile of a graduate? And so through that process, we connected with a, an organization called Education Reimagined, and they have five uh, pillars or five elements, they call them, to their North Star. And that powerful learning is uh, competency-based, it's personalized, relevant, and contextualized, it's characterized by high levels of learner agency, it's open-walled, and it's socially embedded. And through our conversations, we were hearing a lot of those same elements, maybe not the same language, but we were hearing those same elements from our stakeholders. And so we began to have intentional conversations about what does learning in a transformed learning environment need to look like? And so these two things together really um, have grounded our vision and provided us as leaders and as stakeholders within the organization a direction for which we're moving in this um, effort to transform our learning, our education system. So it brings us to our next breakout question before we get to our final section. And this deals with vision. So how clear is your organization's vision for transformation? And in developing that vision, how have you engaged your stakeholders to define what matters most beyond traditional kinds of metrics and accountability systems. And I'm wondering if, yeah, I'm wondering if this time, instead of breaking into small groups of people would be, uh, would A, volunteer to type in their responses in the text chat. Um, and so you can amplify them. And also if somebody would volunteer to come up on stage and talk about what they're doing in their school or their district by clicking on that raise hand button. Uh, while they're doing that, you know, as you're talking, one of the things that, that dawned on me is, you know, to what extent was the fact that you were giving everybody agency, um, it, it, was that as important, more important, or less important than the actual things that they came up with? The, well, I think, we were, we were creating the conditions for people to accept that agency. Mm -hmm. And as in any organization, there will be people that will accept that agency and there'll be people that will kindly not accept the agency. Right. And that's okay. And I think we need to accept that's where people are. Um, mm -hmm. I think those people that did accept the agency were very engaged in the conversation. I think back to those, um, how many teachers do we have? 12 or 15 teachers, Lynn? 
uh, in the first Innovate Salisbury group, something like that. I don't remember. I don't remember. But there were some really, uh, at the time, engaging, lots of synergy in the room about how could we think about something different. And we did have teachers uh, in that group that were interested in doing something different, in interested mm -hmm. in exploring innovation. Um, and I think from a leadership perspective, which we're going to close out today on uh, in our third section, is when you want to transform an organization, you want to start at the edges. Um, organizations have certain immunities built into them, and you want to find those innovators, those people that are open-minded and whose mind mindsets have already shifted, and how mm -hmm. do you support them as a leader in bringing about some of that change, and then have them uh, create some successes, and then how does that help to build the momentum mm -hmm. to more of a systemic change? So starting at the edges um, is an important way, I think, to approach this from our perspective. Okay. So um, let's, I guess, uh, why don't I expand the slides again and we can advance through that because that sounds like, a, you know, the this is how you get started. Sounds good. So our last piece tonight is how do we support the vision? And, and while Randy and I led the development of our vision in this professional learning, um, there's also a lot here that we co-led with our building principals and our, our central office members. So I think it's really important to um, emphasize that we're all working to support this work and this vision and that our building leaders and our um, other central office leaders play as important a role in this too. So let's talk a little bit about how we can support the vision for transformation uh, once you have identified it in your context. So Randy and I have spent a lot of time learning, and I think that's been one of the ways that we've really supported this vision. Our principals and our teachers said, okay, those learning beliefs sound great, but what does it really look like? And Randy mentioned earlier that we partnered with Education Reimagined, and we're um, really learning from the work that they have been doing. We created a podcast, Shift Your Paradigm, uh, from school center to learner centered. And on that podcast, we're really investigating the question um, about learner centered leadership and learner centered learning. Um, we're learning about learning environments that reflect the learning beliefs that we have adopted from um, all of those that Randy mentioned uh, open walled and learner agency and competency based learning. And we're learning about individual learning organizations, talking to their leaders and often their learners. So we're demonstrating ourselves as learners in this open walled environment and modeling for our, our colleagues, our teachers, and our leaders. So how else are we supporting? Uh, we're supporting our teacher development. We shared a little bit of information um, about professional learning. We shared uh, the podcast that we started with Shift Your Paradigm, and we also started prior to Shifter Paradigm, a podcast focused on leading teaching and learning. So TL Talk Radio uh, focused all about learning some innovations, talking with book authors about the work that they have done, talking with educational practitioners, and even sharing some of our work um, to really be a resource for our teachers and our leaders and to help us learn through this process because um, as we shared, it's a heavy lift and it requires a lot of different thinking, um, a lot of voices and perspective and engagement and learning along the way. So in addition to supporting teacher development, um, in those ways, we also had our Leading Your Salisbury cohort. So in year one, we brought a team of three to four teachers, as well as their building leaders together. Now we're a small school district. If you remember at the top of the conversation I shared, uh, we have four buildings and 1600 learners. So this is really doable for us to bring four building leadership teams into one room and have these conversations. And at the end of, of year one, after some direct instruction and engagement activities, um, some learning about the learning beliefs, and even an innovative project that each teacher completed and shared out, we did some surveying and we assessed our work. Uh, what we dis discovered was that we had learned a lot. Uh, these teachers led professional learning alongside their building principals in their buildings to help build capacity. But at the end of the year, we realized that we hadn't built as much understanding of our profile of a graduate and our learning beliefs as we 
as we thought we might. It took, uh, it's go slow <laughs> to go far, right, or to go fast. Um, so we decided to implement this group again for year two. We followed a very similar structure in which we led some whole group district-wide professional learning, and our building leaders led some um, small group building learning in their own buildings, and then also used their teacher teams to create professional learning uh, for their full, full building teams. Um, so their work has been really important as we scaled this up, and we got to the place this year where we're no longer doing a pullout of cohorts, but now we're looking at the entire district. So for us, this is a real tipping point. And this is a, a significant amount of time and, and energy expended by our teachers and our leaders um, as we are learners. Um, we shared the podcast all, idea already, and you can check those podcasts out. We encourage you to, to take a listen, and um, we're always looking for guests to share their expert ideas as well. In addition to supporting teachers, we also need to support parents. Um, Randy and I conduct coffee and conversations. We don't tend to get a whole lot of parents, but um, we tend to have really good conversations with those who do show up to engage with us. Early on when we disrupted our, our some of our families' homes by providing our, our learners with um, MacBooks to take home, grades 6 to 12. We are a one-to-one -one district. Those students are taking them home. And all of a sudden, that became a challenge for parents in terms of management of the devices and setting expectations and norms in their houses based on their, their personal values. So we have provided some parent guidance along the way, and we share many documents and resources on our website, tl2020.org. Um, and this has been really important for us. In addition to supporting teachers and parents, we also support leaders. This year, our admin team, ourselves included, participated in a retreat. Um, and at that retreat, we developed this compass. Our admin team developed this compass. And this compass really shows what's next for us. So our primary goal, our why, is to develop a competent learner. And we want that learner to be competent um, in the skills that we've identified and also have those knowledge and dispositions. Uh, we have our learning beliefs in the left-hand side there in the center. And um, we're designing new tasks for our learners so that our learners can develop the critical thinking, communication, collaboration, creativity, and those other soft skills and those other human uh, plus computer skills that we talked about earlier in the conversation. And a really critical piece to this, um, reflecting back to what one of our listeners said tonight, is this idea of feedback and assessment and ongoing feedback and iteration. So um, we work to support our leaders, we engage our leaders in conversations, and we work together to, to move this, this work forward in our district. So for our listeners, um, maybe you can share some ideas in the chat of how you work to support the vision for transformation in in your school district. And I was wondering, while they're doing that, uh, you must have examples of where you've seen kids or students uh, doing things that you hadn't seen students do at all before you did this. So maybe you can share some of the examples of how you've seen the kids themselves transform. Sure. So I'll share one um, that our high school principal has been working on in, over the past two years. Uh, she worked to develop an internship program in our high school. Uh, we started pretty small, <laughs> um, but we're so excited because these students are really having a lot of great opportunities. Um, so for example, we have a media uh, st studio with a teacher, dedicated teacher, um, he's an English teacher and focuses on teaching some media courses, which he designed. We have a live, um, ac actually, it's a recorded TV studio that broadcasts over two radio, um, two cable channels, uh, two local cable channels, so our parents can see them. Um, they record shows. They create um, uh, fun spots, Salisbury Falcon Network. And we had two interns were actually the show managers. So they were responsible for 
um, working to gather content, produce content, uh, load content into the computer system so that the content would go out to um, our stakeholders in the community. They coordinated and collaborated with teachers so that we could have um, an hour for our elementary schools dedicated on the program. So they really learned a lot of skills. And if you connect back to um, that chart that we showed earlier on, it's a great example of virtual collaboration and development of um, the knowledge, skills, and dispositions that are embedded in our profile of a graduate. So that's one example, um, a, a sort of um, getting that off the ground, our internship program. So that sounds to me like one of the things that that does is it also gives the kids context for what they're learning in school. Because if they're producing these videos, then somehow or other they have to learn how to communicate better, which involves writing and critical thinking. Um, and uh, very often they need to present things mathematically, like, you know, 30% of people did this. or um, And so they need to learn how to present data and work with data better and so that they, they they then see the context for the things that they're learning in school which then reinforces uh their desire to learn the academic subjects also that's i think the ideal right yeah i think um the tv studio and the internship is one example of creating an authentic audience right because now mm -hmm. you're creating this you're creating this video that your family can see your friends can see um, you know, people across the valley can turn on channel 68 on RCN cable and see your work. Um, so creating that open walled opportunity for our learners to really um, know that the work matters has been has been uh, meaningful for us. And, and many kids have the opportunity to contribute to the channel. Um, the interns are the ones who really put it together and, and get it out um, for the public. But even mm -hmm. our elementary students are submitting videos that they've created um, so that others can can view the work. And the work is amplified in a way that we haven't been able to do in the past. Incredible. OK, do you have more? Do you want me to advance? I'll expand the slides. I guess they are expanded. Um, let me let's let's move on. Sure. I think there's really just one more slide, which is sort of wrapping up tonight. Um, we wanted to. Uh, after our hour of conversation, challenge you to think about this idea of transformation and how is your mindset or the way that you think about transformation and the ideas that we put out there around transformation, how has that changed? So using a sort of sentence starter, I used to think, but now I think. And then something that you want to learn more about, um, you know, can't cover everything in an hour and through engagement is really how we, how we learn and deepen our understanding around these concepts. So. If you had the opportunity, what would you like to have a conversation about? What more would you like to learn about? And then thinking into the future, as a result of today's conversation, what would be your next steps, whether that be tomorrow, next week, next month, or even next year? And what might be some of the barriers in the way that you could overcome those barriers? So we really just wanted to finish off today with some um, personal reflection and uh, give anybody the opportunity to share um, with a larger group about one or more of those uh, sort of word props, those sentences. And for yourselves, like what what do you view as your next step over the, let, let me pick like one of the later ones, like what do you view as your next steps over the next month? So we just had um, a professional learning day this past Monday because of the, the mm -hmm. federal holiday. And uh, as Lynn mentioned earlier, our sort of year long goal is how do we take the work of the previous years, which was this pockets of innovation, and how do we scale that up? How do we make this systemic so that all teachers are um, working on the edges and trying out some innovations? So that's sort of our year long goal. And there was lots of energy and lots of very positive feedback Mm -hmm. uh, to that professional learning. So I think over the next month, it's how do we engage um, with our school leaders and with those teachers around consistently having conversations, elevating that conversation around transformation so that this becomes really a cultural thing. How does mm -hmm. the idea of transformation and task redesign that Lynn mentioned, 
become something that is the common conversation, the dominant conversation. So I think over the next month, it's how do we support our principals and join with them to really make this transformation scale uh, this year. And, and those are some immediate things over the next month or so, I would say, from my perspective. What do you think, Lynn? Yeah, so I think, um, you know, we also want to spend some time looking at some survey data after our professional learning on Monday. We asked teachers to give us some feedback. So we have reviewed that sort of on a, a cursory review. We want to go back and really look at that and identify any action steps that we might take from that um, because we'll come back together as a group in January. So we'll take that feedback and um, use that to plan our next session. I think we also want to engage with some of our teachers about the projects and tasks that they're working on so that we can learn more about the successes that they're having and the challenges that they may face um, and be a support for them and as they iterate through this process. Well, it's a fascinating journey and it never stops, right? I don't um, know so when it would ever stop. Right. <laughs> we have a lot of work to do. We have had a lot of successes and we have you know, we have a lot more work to do. Our system is um, has been here a long time, and and it's going to take some navigating to move to the um, the approach that ultimately we would like to to see occurring in all of our classrooms across the district and across our state. Well, and across the country, because as we're you know you're doing um, here and and at FETC, you're sharing what you're doing. Um, so that other people can do it in their classrooms and in their districts everywhere. I think that's really important. And, you know, wanted to thank you for everything that you're doing and for appearing tonight. Okay. So, um, so it, looking forward to meeting you in, um, in Orlando in January. And uh, hopefully I can attend your, your session. Um, and thank you. Do you have a, a last, uh, last thoughts that you want to impart on the archive or to people who are here? No, but thank you very much for joining us. And um, if you're watching or listening to the archive, we'd love if you would reach out and share some of your work with us. We love to learn also from others and the work that they've um, developed along along the way. Thank you. Okay, well, uh, Lynn and Randy, thank you very much. I'll I'll I'll, I'll bring you down uh, so that you can have a, have a good rest of the evening. Evening. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg uh, signing off for EdChat Interactive. Want to thank FETC again for uh, for bringing uh, Randy and Lynn here. Uh, you can see more of them at FETC and get more hands-on tips about how to transform your classrooms uh, and and your schools. Uh, down in Orlando in January. So uh, good night, everybody, and uh, hope to see you next week when we talk about uh, different ways of using video in classes. Uh, good night.